I was pretty tired. That was a well-earned snore. Hey, and I just noticed too, uh, did you notice if you look at the bottom of the screen, you are also Russ Nordstrand according to this webinar? Uh, no, I did not notice that. Well, it says that both of our names are Russ Nordstrand. So guys, okay. in case you get confused, Russell Graves has the beard, Russ Nordstrand wishes he had the beard. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Hey, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm assuming everybody can hear us, but if you uh, if you can hear and see us and see the screen that's in front of you, if you don't mind, just pop in something on the Q&A there and let us know that everything's good from our end. Yeah, you guys should have a chat panel. Everybody should have a, a chat panel on the right. There's a there's a chat and there's a Q&A. And there's also a handout section where uh, you can actually download the um, the trip packet for Birds and Wildlife of the Everglades. Um, oh, Kenton Kruger's on there. Hey, Stan. Stan's on there, too. Hi, everybody. Good, Good. to see everyone out here. Good to see everybody. Um, yeah, fantastic. So, yeah, again, you guys can download the trip packet if you want to for Birds and Wildlife of the Everglades. Um, and then, um, you know, obviously at the end of our little slideshow today, uh, we've got a, we're doing a, an early registration. So if you want to sign up today, uh, we'll give you a discount on the trip for our upcoming dates. And um, Russell's basically just going to run through and, and show you a, a phenomenal slideshow of the work he did down there, the photography work he did down there over the winter. We ran two, uh, two special, uh, you know, trips um, that we had never done before. And they were both wildly successful. Just, a, just an awesome time to be down in, in uh, you know, in, in the Florida Everglades. Um, so yeah, we're going to run through that today and just kind of show you what it's all about. Yeah. And you know, the presentation today, it's not fancy. I don't have a lot of fancy transitions or a lot of fancy text. You know, uh, we've all heard the old saying that a picture speaks a thousand words and, uh, I've got about 94,000 words for, to say today then. So this, uh, got a, got a lot of pictures in here. Some I'll spend a little time on some I'll kind of just show real quick and move to the next one. But, uh, one of the things that, you know, I, I've told you this before, Russ, I do public speaking all over the state of Texas. And one of the things that I really enjoy about speaking live is the interaction you have with the audience in our, in, in the days of zoom, you know, that's lost to some degree, but I want to encourage everybody. I want this to be as much of a dialogue as we can make it and not necessarily a monologue. So if you have any questions about any of the birds I show or any of the wildlife I show any of the pictures and how I got them, the techniques involved, uh, or any other questions about the trip in general, just feel free to, to speak up and, and uh, I'll answer them as best I can. And so I know half of everything there is to know. Russ knows the other half of everything there is to know. So between us, surely we can answer the questions or at least make up a good answer in that, that regard. That's right. Are you, are you ready to go, Russ? Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, so uh, really just opening up this slideshow, we've got this picture of uh, Anhinga. You know, by traditional standards, Anhingas are, probably would what you would classify as a little bit of an ugly bird. They, they swim with their whole body down in the water, just their head sticks up. That's why they call them a snake bird. But if you can find one in the morning when there's, when they're sunning like this and letting their wings drip dry because they don't, their wings take on water unlike a lot of uh, waterborne birds. And so they've got to, every now and then they've got to get on a, a tree limb like this and, and dry off and just make such a cool sight when you see that first light in the morning, like this picture here, uh, I took. It's just pretty, pretty neat to see these birds. And so they're really cool watching the fish, but they're really cool when you're seeing them animated as they dry off during the day. I mean, it looks like that. That dude looks like he's going to take off, but they're, they are not graceful flyers at all. They're pretty much good for flying up on a limb and then they can dive back down in the water to fish. We saw lots of those birds there. In fact, one of the trails we, we frequent a lot when we go on this trip is the Anhinga Trail. If, if you don't know the Anhinga Trail, it's a world famous birding trail that's in the Everglades and uh, it's so accessible. It's an easy trail to walk. It's it's a uh, it's a fairly short trail at that, but it's just a boardwalk, man made boardwalk that goes through this freshwater swamp. And uh, man, we, we we I guess in the two trips, I'm trying to think to myself out loud, but I guess on the two trips for us, we we took. Four or six different I think two or three trips per outing that we did, we did, we went to the Anhinga trail just because, uh, not for lack of other sites, but just because the Anhinga trail was so good. No matter when you went, you saw it in a little bit different light and a little different group of species of animals would come around and, and, uh, be there. This one, actually, we saw a lot of these green herons in the, on the Anhinga trail 
but I actually took this one at the Dean Darling National Wildlife Refuge. And that's another place that if you're into, uh, into uh, birding that is world famous, uh, was, was founded in, I think, about 1950. And it's just one of those world-class birding hotspots that when, when the really hardcore birders, the, guy, the guys who are trying to create that life list, of all these bird species go to look at birds. This is one of the places they go and it's just a remarkable place. And what's even more remarkable about it, you know, you, all, you, as a lifelong wildlife or most of my life, I photographed wildlife. I started when I was like 17 years old photographing wildlife. And so one of the, the one of the two things you always try to do is try to find number one, how, to, how you can get closer to animals that are truly wild or number two, find places like the Ding Darling or like the Anhinga trail where wildlife is just accustomed to seeing people. And uh, and you can it's fairly approachable, like these green herons and Ding Darling. I mean, just walking down the trail, we we encountered him, and you know it's it's a it, again it's a they're they're beautiful birds. You can see all the green irides iridescence in his feathers, uh, and they're kind of an interesting little bird. They're they're a, they're a wading bird, so they fish in the water, they feed in the water, and uh, but. You, you get scenes like this that, you know, just that really, really dark background in the, in the bird just lit up in perfect light. It's almost like they set these places up for photographers just because the light's always right. You know, in the, in the key times that we try to go out the morning and the evening. This is a little blue heron. This, this is a, I haven't seen a whole lot of little blue herons in my lifetime around here in Texas. We have the big great blue herons and you see those a lot, but these little blue herons are, pretty remarkable in themselves and there you can see them preening i found out later that this was a pretty unusual sighting that we saw down there this is a, a red uh a red herring and uh they're not they're that common down there but we happen to find one just right off the road that's beautiful it is yeah they're really pretty birds yeah, and so if anybody's wondering the way the, the the way this I keep talking about trails and the way this trip is set up, when I talk about trails, obviously you got to park somewhere and go from point A to point B. But most of these trails where the good birding hotspots are are really close. And you know, I was talking to Ben Blankenship about this not long ago about the concept of how some of these national wildlife refuges and how some of these national parks are set up and how they were designed. And they build the roads right by the coolest places to see. Who would ever thunk it? But yeah, the uh, even on this trip here, the, uh, you know, a lot of times we're cruising down the road looking for wildlife, especially on the Ding Darling where it's a, got a fairly long road system in there. And it's just the animals are so used to seeing you. Once you see a good target like we saw there, you just pull off, get your lens out and spend a little time shooting pictures of it. And the crazy thing is there's so many bird species down there. And it might be a good way to, that might be a, a, a good trivia question for everybody listening. I'll, it's between one and a hundred. Pick how many different species of birds that we documented when we were down there photographing. And, and uh, I'd, I'd like to see everybody's guesses as they, as they pop in. And I'll give you that answer later on. But, you know, the cool thing is you may be photographing this heron and then all of a sudden 10 other different kind of birds show up around it and they're feeding in the same area. And so it was really cool. And, th and the next cool thing about it, you've got your traditional wading birds that will wait out in these shallow water lagoons. But then, uh, you know, you get the shorebirds like this, like this little sanderling here that that uh, just feed for little crabs and whatever once the tide goes down. And we hit it just right with the tides this year. The, you know, and that's that's how we plan this trip. We planned it around the tides. You know, one of the things we kept hearing from uh, uh, Gabe, the boat operator on the bald eagles of Alaska, was how they live and live and breathe by the tides around there. And it was we we planned this trip originally, but based on when the tides are going to be advantageous for us to be out, and it really paid off where you get to see just bird after bird that we saw through the week. You actually saw there, this is, look, this is me being a little creative, but you can see one, two, three, four of those birds in this picture. And uh, they were all, they were all, there was, a, there was a lagoon and because of the trees, when the sun came up, part of the lagoon was shaded. And then there was another part and you can see the clear demarcated line in the sand of where it was shaded. And then all of a sudden sun and all of these birds moved out into the uh, into the sun to warm up when the when the when the sun first came up. And that was all them sitting in a row. It's kind of cool to see. 
Yeah, I mean, I can I can show you bird after bird that we saw, and this was again, this was on the on the trip that we took. Uh, we took well, we took, and I can't remember the exact dates. Maybe you have them at, at, uh, handy, but we took two two trips. One was uh, about mid February, and then the second one was a, a, a week after that one. It was at, at the end of February, and uh, again, just. Just, but every time is a good time to be there in the winter time because that's one of those destinations. It's a, uh, a tropical location, and it's warm most all all year long. I mean, with the rare exception that it gets cold down there, the temperatures are pretty stable all year long. And when the birds are like people, they want to go somewhere to be warm. The Florida Everglades is where they go. And this this picture here, this was actually taken from the boat. So one of the things about this trip is we take three boat rides, and uh, on the boat rides we'll actually go out into this area called the 10,000 islands uh, part of the Everglades national park. And on, and the cool thing about being in a boat and I, I've seen this before doing stuff personally, but when wildlife sees you uh, when wildlife sees you in a car or even in a boat, they just don't recognize you as being as much of a threat and so you can just creep right up on them. So these, these two Brown pelicans here, was taken from the boat and they were actually flying past as, as we were just cruising around looking for other wildlife. And, uh, you know, the, the, uh, uh, cool thing about these, these exposures like this, you see them a lot, but one of the things I'm proud of was on this trip and we knowing we'd have tricky exposures like this, where you've got the dark background and you've got the well-lit bird. We covered that and we covered birds in flight before we even left out. And really, uh, Day one, the, the guests on the trip were getting really, really good pictures. And then this is another great site we saw. This was actually on the bird trip as well. The uh, Just a big colony of white pelicans. Did, Russ, did you know that white pelicans are the second largest bird in North America? Interesting. You know, I don't think I did know that. California condor is number one. Uh, that's the yeah, biggest bird in terms of just wingspan. But these, uh, what what's incredible about these white pelicans down there is we saw literally hundreds of them. You'd see them in big colonies like this, and uh, this actually was uh, was not in the. I mean, this is in good light. I love backlighting, especially on white birds. But uh, this was actually not in the best light. But it was just such a huge colony of birds. I, I should have included the slideshow in it. I actually took a panoramic panorama shot of these birds, and if you could see all of them just hanging out on the sandbar. Uh, as they were sunning like that, it was just pretty, pretty incredible. Oh, there it is. I did include it. Yeah. Look at that. That's the sheer number of birds yeah, that's that we, awesome. we saw. And, you know, and, wow. and I'll get into more of that later, but you know, we've got birds in flight, you know, most of the birds I've shown have been just pretty stagnant like that one's feeding. That one's actually just kind of stretching out getting ready to fly off. Uh, but in terms of, I, I did a video, I don't know if everybody saw it, but it's on the Backcountry Journeys uh, tribe page. But I did a video while I was down there about kind of the three shots that I always try to get of just about any sort of wildlife. And just to paraphrase it, I always talk about shooting pictures of uh, just kind of getting the yearbook shot. You know, I want to get a good representation of that, of that particular species, whether it's a bird or a mammal or whatever. So that's kind of the first shot I always try to get for myself. The second shot I always get, I always try to get is a uh, is a shot of a bird in its environment, and that's what this is. Just kind of this is this is this bird hanging out with other birds. It's in a larger environment. You can see, and the third type of shot I usually get is a is a the animal in action, doing some kind of feeding behavior or mating behavior or or flying around or running or something like that. Some sort of behavior you typically see that animal. And the really what inspired me to do that video is uh, after the first day we were down there. I saw that the Florida Everglades were really a good opportunity to, to, to take all three of those pictures of just about every animal we saw. We'd see them perched. We'd see them, you could take it in their bigger environment. And then we, we almost always got all these animals in action, which was a, just a, a super way not only experience the animal, but also experience the area. And so my motto is on backcountry journeys, we love all of God's creatures. And so we'll even stop for a crawdad when we find it. And this was a crawdad that we, we found hanging out on the side of the road. I was actually driving down the road and I saw two or three crossing the road and I drove slow so we wouldn't run over them. 
And then I, I just told one of the guests, I said, let's stop and look at that guy. Cause, cause there's a couple of guests that had never seen him before or never seen him up close. So we, we stopped and he did his best impression to try to scare us off with his pinchers up there. And, uh, and we, we took a few pictures of him. So, and that was, that, that was pretty cool. Uh, I don't, I don't know if you ever did this or not growing up where you grew up, but in the South where I grew up, we used to crawdad fish as kids. We, it was always so much fun. We would tie a piece of bacon or bologna on a string and run it down their hole. Cause they'll, they'll dig holes that they nest in, in the, in the mud and we'd run it down their hole and they'd always clamp onto it and you just slowly drag them out. And we didn't catch them for any particular reason just to look at them and, and put them back in their hole. And uh, because of those experiences as a boy doing that growing up out in the country, I, I won't lie to you. I've always kind of had an affinity for crawdads. I just I think they're a cool little crustacean species and they're they're an important part of the food chain. And they're just really, really cool little animals. Now, believe it or not, we uh, I, I grew up in the in the northwest, the Pacific Northwest, the, the Seattle area. And, and uh, now, believe it or not, we have them up there, too. Really? Yeah. Yeah. And the yep. crazy thing is the crazy thing about crayfish is the appropriate name for them the proper name but the crazy thing about crayfish is i don't know the exact number but there's there's dozens and dozens of different species of them and they are uh discovering new species of them almost yearly in fact there's a native grass prairie meadow just south of where i live that a new species of crayfish was discovered there just a few years ago and it amazes me that stuff like this lives under our nose and we just don't appreciate it enough. And that, so that's why I said that I, I try to love all of God's creatures and give them the respect they, they deserve and try to take cool pictures of all of them. <laughs> I didn't know this. So fellow guide Ben Blankenship, I shared some of these pictures with him because when I was down there, he was asking how it was going. So I texted him a few shots. And in Costa Rica, this is, they call this candy corn bird. And because of the way it's... Yeah, because the way its beak looks, it looks like a piece of candy corn. And I, I learned that new. I, I knew it as a more complicated name, a purple gallinule. And uh, you want to talk about a neat, interesting and beautiful bird. So these things, if you if you look at this picture and I, I, I know I've got some more pictures of gallinules in there, but I don't know if I've got uh, pictures of their feet. But if you look at the feet in this one, they're, they're almost like snow skis. I mean, snowshoes. They're huge. And the reason why their feet are so big is they can actually walk across the top of those lily pads. And that's where we'd see them is walking across the top of lily pads in search for, in search of food. They, a lot of times they'd eat the flower petals off the lily pads. And, uh, but it's amazing how they could just walk around them. So they live at night, they roost kind of in the brush along the edge of the wetlands. And in the day they just come out and look for food and forage for food. And you'll see they're really visible and, uh, just, I mean, look at the colors on that thing. Just the purple and the blue iridescence of it is just incredible. So this was kind of a twofer that we saw one day. And the twofer was this. Uh, one, I can count on one hand how many freshwater eels I've ever seen in my life. And this one still doesn't get me past one hand counting this one. And number two, this great blue heron, to see him hunting that morning for that for that eel that he found in the marshland and just the brutality in which he tried to kill that thing which he never killed it never got it but uh it was a just reminds you of how tough life and the life and death struggle is in nature every time we see it but uh yeah when i first saw him with it he had it he, he, he was pecking at something and i stopped to watch him and he picked it up and at first i thought it was a snake and then i realized that's not a snake that's a that's a creepy looking freshwater eel and uh, it's just a, it was a neat sight to watch. I actually got a little video of that sight too. Cause he, he did that for probably five minutes in front, in front of us. And uh, it was, uh, it's I always like seeing that stuff, but that's the kind of, you know, I was talking earlier about the three main shots I try to get behavior being one of them. That's a key type of behavior. Cause I've got plenty of pictures of great blue heron just standing around doing what they do. Cause they'll stand motionless for hours waiting on fish to, to swim by them. But, to actually see him in the process of hunting was pretty cool as well. And there's another Anhinga. I'm a sucker, Russ, for nice backgrounds. And if I can get backgrounds like this, then I'm I'm pretty happy. And it to me it makes the it makes an otherwise kind of weird looking bird uh, a lot prettier when you get a nice background like this. But this was yeah, this that, was that is really down nice. there too. Yeah. 
beautiful boca or bouquet or bouquet, right depending on how you say I, it. I just call it. I'm a I'm a simple country boy. Nice I just call it. Too. I just call it backgrounds. Yeah. So <laughs> after the first trip, I discovered something unusual there, and I and I wish I'd have known it on the first trip, but I I, I revealed it to the second group group that we had, and that is if you've never taken a black vulture picture in your life, get ready because I'm going to give you the best opportunity in the world. Come to find out, there's a secret parking area down there that when you park there, if you leave your vehicle, the black vultures like to come sit on it when you're gone. And so we came back. We came back and we've got the Black Backcountry Journeys van there and there's about 10 turkey vultures sitting on top of it. And not only our vehicle, but everybody's. I don't know what it is about that that they like, uh, but they would just come hang out around the vehicles. And so, uh, again, in the in the essence of loving all of God's creatures, uh even though a black vulture has the face that only a mother could love, still take time to take a picture of it because it's a that's an important part of the ecosystem and and uh, and an important bird species for all of or all of North America, where not only the black vulture but also the turkey vulture resides. And did you know, speaking of turkey vultures, and we saw plenty of those as well, did you know that's the only North American bird that can smell? Or b both vultures. Both vultures have the ability to smell. Most birds don't, but they do. That's how they find their food. Nice. This was kind of this was kind of an elusive bird, but we were able to find some. This is a red-shouldered hawk, and it's pretty common to the Everglades. And uh, but just just really pretty. And I, I say elusive. We'd see them. We saw a lot of them, but usually they're they were a hundred yards out. But towards the end of the first trip, no. Yeah, towards the end of the first trip, we started. I don't know what changed about it, because that's the, that's the one thing that that I try to be keen to. And we I, we you and I've talked about it a lot. How wildlife species have these nuances that we don't necessarily understand. And I don't know if it's the if it's the dropping humidity or if it's the availability of food or if it's all of that stuff. But you know, you go by one spot one day, and that's what makes wildlife photography neat. We talked about this last week is the hunt. That's what we love about wildlife photography is just hunting for animals. But you go past one day and all the animals are, are you know, like these red-shouldered hawks are 100 yards off the road. You come back the next day and they're right up on the road and you go back the day after that and they're kind of midway in between. And so, uh, you know, just being able to identify them and know where they're at and kind of keep that in the back of your mind and be able to go back and circle back again to where you'd seen them before, uh, you know, that persistence and patience finally, finally pays off. Russell, we have a question on the on the board. Um, okay, was that last image shot with a six hundred millimeter lens? That's from Swati. This picture here. Yeah. Hey, Swati. Uh, no, this picture was taken with a five hundred millimeter lens. And so, if you've ever traveled with me before, you'll see I use a, a big lens, and that big lens is big for one reason. It's got a, a lot of glass in the front of it because it's the lens I use professionally. Uh, when I shoot pictures for magazines or other clients that I work for. And I bought that lens. That's a 15 year old lens that I use. I bought it a long time ago. But uh, one thing I'm quick to tell people is you don't have to have a lens like I use because it costs a lot of money, but you don't have to have a lens like I use to shoot pictures like this. I know a lot of people use those 150 to 600. Uh, I think Tamron's and Sigma's and Tokina all make them. And they're great lens for this, this for a trip like this as well. Yeah. That's the one to 400. Is that what that one is? Or is yeah. that the one to five? No, this is the one to four. This is the old one. Yeah, a lot of but, people use yeah. that one. Also yeah, so uh, yeah, so it was taken with 500 millimeter. And I was probably, to put that in perspective, we were probably, I'm looking outside to gauge sort of a distance to get it in my mind. I'm going to say 15 yards from the bird, so... 30, 35, 40 feet, something like that. Not real far. And then again, that's that's the cool thing is if I found a red-shouldered hawk in Fannin County where I live, I may hunt all year long just to try to get close to it and up to it. But these birds down there, they're just so used to seeing people. And, you know, uh, southern Florida is populated. I mean, there's these birds, but they they I think they're onto something down there because even though it's populated, you know, between Fort Myers and Naples and Homestead, Miami, and that whole area, even though it's populated, 
not only do they reserve a, a ton of land in the Everglades that are just untouched by humans, but they're also pretty good at understanding the value of wildlife. And so there's a lot of green spaces in the city. And so it's likely that even though this bird may not see a lot of people during the day out in the Everglades when we're out in the wilderness, if it's going back into town at any point in its life, it's it's just been used to being around around people. And this is another bird with with a face only a mother could love, and uh, we saw a lot of these things too. They're they're, uh, I mean, look at that thing. I mean, he's crazy looking. Yeah. It's a wood stork. Yeah. And this is one of those species that was once a, th a threatened species, but I think they're on the rebound because of, you know, all the things we just talked about. But it's a, uh, they're a big lumbering bird. We, you know, I, I, unfortunately we saw them in flight, but I was always too late on the trigger to be able to, to uh, photograph one in flight. I think I may have one or two pictures of it in flight, but we'd see them a lot just sitting up in trees like this or feeding down in the water. And, uh, but again, just a, a really interesting looking bird, really unusual bird. And these snowy egrets that we'd see down there, it's just, I mean, incredible. It's uh, its like they have their own hairdresser. You can see how be beautiful it looks like it, he's got his feathers hanging off the back of their head. And for, for me, a shot like this is kind of, this is the ideal for me, a good, this is the yearbook shot I talked about earlier. If you're going to do a yearbook picture of this book, of this bird, this is the one. And just a picture of this bird against a dark background to really show the contrast and help you see a little bit of feather detail is, at this, I mean, that's the kind of things we hunt for. And again, uh, just being completely honest about it, we had those those opportunities every day, every single day. I love snowy egrets. I think they're one of the prettiest birds. We see those all the time, um, you know, running the Costa Rica trips yeah. down the ocean. So they're, they're just everywhere. And, you know, and I don't know if you guys can tell this or not, because sometimes the resolution on the webinars isn't isn't perfect. But those eyes are razor sharp. That is that's an awesome image. That's just beautiful. Yeah. And, and what thank appreciate that. And what's cool about them, you know, and that's the one it's one thing to see them is cool. But to see them in action is really cool. They have bright yellow feet. And when you see them hunting for fish when they're waiting around, They'll wiggle, their, they'll wiggle their feet real quick, and it acts like a lure. Well, fish will swim up to them, and it makes it, it, makes it easier to uh, – oh, bless you. And it makes it easier to uh, for them to catch fish. So it's it's cool to see them watch, to see them stand in the water and wiggle in one foot trying to attract fish to them. And I, I may I – don't, I don't remember or not. I may have a picture of that, of just they've got – so if you look at that area around his eye, their feet are the same color, black legs, and then they've got really bright yellow feet. Just really cool. There's another picture. One of the things I like trying to do is put a foreground element, like just like a landscape photographer in some of these wildlife shots to kind of uh, add a little interest. And that's exactly what I did here. That bird allowed me to move around where I could put a little bush between me and it and kind of shoot through the bush and kind of adds a little more mystery to the photo. It kind of looks like the bird's trying to hide a little more in my mind. And, and that's why, I, that's why I did that. And then that's a, so we saw some baby, we didn't see a lot of baby alligators, but we were able to find some and you gotta, you gotta really be on the money to be able to find baby alligators just because they're so small. And I mean, they could, in their camouflage, they could be right beside you and you'd never see them. But we were, we, we found a group of five one day and this is one of them that we, we photographed down there, but you gotta watch out because mama still helps look out for them. So mama, mama was, was nearby, but we, you know, we use telephoto lenses on these. We didn't, we didn't put the alligators, the babies, nor the mama in any stress at all. They just laid out basking in the sunlight while we took their picture. Hey, Russell, uh, Stan is asking, hi, Stan. He's asking uh, if there is a lens that's too big for this trip. And I know you've got an 800 prime stand, so that's probably what you're asking there. Um, my first, my gut reaction to that is probably not. I think, I think an 800 prime probably gets you some, some really nice close-ups. What do you think, Russell? I, th I think so too. Uh, yeah. So the the cool thing about it, for the most part, the the uh, the locations in which we photograph, you've got plenty of room to move around. So if you are too close, because sometimes with that 500 stand, I find like, feel like I'm a little too close, and I use the uh, I use the uh, oldest zoom that I have, and that's my legs, and just move back, and you you're afforded the opportunity <laughs> yeah. to, to be able to do that. I used to, I used to in the early days when I teach photography and, you know, we I do these these 
camera club presentations and we'd talk about, you know, what's the best way to get close to wildlife. And that's what I always tell them. Use the, use the zoom that's attached to you because your feet are always mm -hmm. the best way first to get closer, get further back from wildlife if you can. And that's the way I do it. Stan is just, uh, you know, I, so I don't, I think 800 would be fine. I really think the sweet spot on this trip is probably a, probably a four to 800 with four being a little bit lean. Uh, but, you know, we had people on the trip using a, a one to 400 zoom, but they put a 1.4 converter on it, which, you know, you lose a little bit of light, but it wasn't appreciable. Number one. And number two, uh, you look, you know, you, it affects the autofocus to some degree, but I think I've been looking at, uh, the guest who went on the trip, looking at pictures they've been sharing on Facebook and, uh, you know, they all look good. I think people were able to, to accomplish what they set out to accomplish. And I think you could too with 800 millimeter lens. You know, again, the modern technology is so great right now. I mean, a lot of these new systems, including the mirrorless systems, you know, uh, uh, then there's the Nikon has the PF 500. That's a beautiful lens, um, lightweight and, you know, maybe a little bit slower, but honestly, the technology is so good. The images are so great from those. Um, you certainly don't need to, you know, to have a, uh, you know, a massive prime lens on these. Um, I've been really enjoying the Canon 100 to 500 on my, uh, on my R5 lately, you know, and that's, uh, uh, it's amazing what it can do. It's a bit slow. It's slower than the old 100-400, just a little bit, because uh, it goes up to 7.1. But uh, just the the quality that comes out of these things is just uh, it's kind of uh, unbelievable. Yeah, and we I mean we we're talking about that last week that we live in the good old days of photography right now. I mean it's just the the tools that we have at our disposal are just incredible. And uh, and I think when you see opportunities like we're showing in this presentation, you know that that's it. I mean, it just proves that, you know, the, the, the optical technology we have and just our, our knowledge base of understanding how to get close to wildlife and just given our, our conservation ethic that we're, we're, we're finally coming around to developing in a, in a really big way in our country. We're not, it's not perfect, but it's better than it was 50 years ago and better than it was 100 years ago. Uh, still protect places like this where you can catch pictures of a cormorant at sunset or a or a frigate bird. I'll show you a picture of a frigate bird later flying, but this is an interesting bird. It's got the largest wingspan to weight ratio of any bird in North America. And uh, that they'll, they will soar for up to 23 hours a day. And we, we actually caught a few that were, we saw them soaring out over the water, but on the boat trips, but we actually saw a few uh, roosting like this during the trip. And they, they're a, uh, they, they feed while they fly. They, they fly down and scoop birds, uh, off, off the water that are, if the birds are close to the surface, they can, they can fly down and get them off the, out of the water, but just an interesting bird. And of course you can't go to Florida without seeing alligators. And we saw plenty of those. I mean, I, if, if I told you, we saw no less than 200 alligators on the trip. Now, granted, not all of them were <laughs> photographable, but you know, we saw a lot of alligators and this is just one we saw. And uh, on the note of alligators, um, Swati, I was also asking, uh, I wanted to say this to you, had a picture. She was asking, do they sneak up on you? Only if you're slow, Swati. <laughs> no, no, they don't. Alligators are pretty content kind of minding their own business. And uh, in fact, I don't mean this demeaning, but you watch an alligator for 10 minutes and uh, alligator will be laying there for 10 minutes and they, uh, and, and then you, your attention gets turned to something else because they're, you know, they're, they're just out there. They, they, they feed underwater. A lot of times we, you know, we never saw any feeding most, when we had see them or they, and they would swim around in the water, but they wouldn't swim a lot. But most of the time when we saw them, they were just out on the, out on the, the beach somewhere sunning, just trying to warm themselves up. Because they're ectothermic, they've got to use the their environment to, for heat, and so that time of year, because it, you know, technically, even though the temperatures were in the seventies, still winter time, so the water's a little bit colder. So they would swim around in the water for a while and get cooled off, and then get back up on land and warm up. So they were, even though they're formidable looking, they were never, we were never in any danger by any of them. So I think the frigate birds are about as uh, deadly as the alligators are in that part of in that part of the Everglades. And there's another one there. That one there is actually doing a bellow and they'll, uh, they call to each other. So they'll, it's kind of a real guttural sort of sound. They'll inflate this, this uh, little dewlap part of their throat and just make that bellow sound. 
and it's uh and it's pretty cool. Russell, remind us how many people can go on this boat? Six. Six people. Yeah. Six photographers. Six photographers, yeah. And then uh this is a wide and it's, it's a pretty it's a flat bottom. Oh go ahead. I was oh, no, just, no. oh go ahead. I was just gonna ask, so it's I've seen a few pictures of it. So it's a it's a flat bottomed uh kind of a swamp skiff, right? I mean you yeah, can even set tripod this thing, right? You can, yeah. It's a Carolina skiff, is what it's called. Yeah. Yeah, it's just a flat bottom, kind of a glorified John boat. It'll take on real skinny water. Uh, in fact, there was some water that we had to skim over. We didn't spend a lot of time on it. That might not have been eight inches deep because as that, that tide, they don't have a big tide down there. It may only move six or seven feet in a day, but when it leaves, it leaves in a hurry. It's like a river. And so, you know, there'd be some times we'd go across one area that we may have two feet of water in. By the time we came back, it may have eight inches of water in. So we've got to kind of get across those, those oyster bars that are down there. And, uh, but a super comfortable platform, though, nonetheless, it was just really stable. I mean, if uh, if we ran across something and I'll show you some pictures we took from the boat here in a little while. If we ran across something that you needed to reposition yourself, you didn't have to worry about falling out. It's got high sides and you could we actually a lot of a lot of the guests, including me, use the side as a support just to get lower to the water and to be able to uh, uh, get a steadier picture at a, at a more interesting angle. This bird here is a is yeah. a uh, I, ibis, and uh, they look like yard chickens because you'll drive by someone's place in in town, and there will be twenty out in their front yard feeding around. But we saw a lot of those. Uh, Charles, the boat captain, he's from Chocoluski. He called them Choc Chocoluski chickens, is what he called them. But we saw a lot lot of ibis. You know, this picture here's here's one of the things that makes me happy, and it shouldn't be all about me, and I don't mean it that way. But one of the goals I've always had as a photographer, Russ, is have the best collection of wildlife images that you can find in Texas. And so I've been spending the last few years of my life checking off those species that, uh, that I just don't have a whole lot of good pictures of. And blue-winged teal are one of them. It's such a beautiful little duck. And we found a hole down there that was just loaded with blue-winged teal. And so just to be able to get pictures like that close up in good light, because we're in the wild, these things are pretty skittish. I mean, it's yeah, I can see them. You know, I see them all the time around here, but they're a hundred yards out into a pasture. And then even they're they're one of the few yeah. birds that get shy to uh, to blinds. And I've got a I've got my own wetland on my place that they come into. But if and I've got a blind built there. But if you sit in the blind, they, it's like they magically know you're there and they won't come around it. But we found a hole down there that was loaded with blue winged teal and was able to get almost at water level with them and just get just cool shots like that in the behavioral shots. And that's nice. that I, the Ibis was in the same hole as the teal were. That's the same water. Those are interesting little birds, you know, I mean, just kind of crazy looking eyes and crazy looking beak, but they're, they're beautiful and they're, they're kind of gregarious birds. They like hanging out with other, other birds of their top. Well, you really nailed the light on that last shot. I mean, that the golden light, you know, on the water there, that's, that's spectacular. Like nice contrast with the white. Yeah. Yeah, that, that is that is gorgeous. Nice shot. Yeah, and there's a lot of lot of opportunities like that there. That's a common turn uh, that we. Uh, no, that's not a common turn. I'm going blank. That's a turn. I, you, you, here's the answer to your question. This is why I can't remember exactly which species of bird this is. We documented seventy different species of birds while we were down there. Seventy. And that's and there's there's undoubtedly some that we didn't see, uh, but seventy while we were down there, and that's in a week's time. So that's an average of six days. So yeah, we're we're seeing ten new species a day every day on average, or more than ten, twelve a day on average of new species that we would find. And when you put it like that, imagine going and taking twelve species today, and then tomorrow you're likely to see the first twelve species. And oh yeah, by the way, we're going to introduce twelve new into the mix. And we're doing that every single day. And it was just crazy. Uh, I'm blank on that one. But I'll, I'll distract my lack of knowledge with this white pelican. That's the big that's the big bird that we saw the big colony of earlier. And there's a brown pelican again. Love the backgrounds. The uh, 
just on a whim, uh, going from point A to point B, I found a pretty cool place to photograph brown pelicans where you can get them just good head and shoulder shots like that. And then uh, also just flat shots like that one. And they'll just fly in one right after another. And the good thing about brown pelicans uh, from, a, from a learner standpoint is they're pretty linear flyers. They're going to go from point A to point B pretty quick. And they're, you know, for their size – their appearance, it appears that they're slow. And, and I don't know, I'm no, I'm no physicist. I can't explain this, but you know, like you see a big 747 jet flying in the air and it looks like it's moving slow, even though it's going 350 miles an hour. That's the same way these things are because they're linear flyers and they're big. They appear to be flying slow. But if you're a learner photographer, this is a, we had a chance to practice birds in flight right before we'd get on the boat and give everybody a chance to kind of warm up and practice their skills on the, on these brown pelicans because they would fly just right into us every time we'd land. There's another one from that same spot, different pelican and, you could, and practice all the lessons that we learned. Mm, nice. Those are kind of, those are kind of weird animals too. in the way they they're, I mean, the way they look, they're just, but they're cool though. The color you know, is just fantastic on some of these. It really is. Yeah, and then, and then this, and then this bird here. This, that's my favorite pose of a bird in flight. You know, wings out, kind of a three quarter coming in. He's pitching a little bit, and his feet are down because he's getting ready to do that final kind of flare before he lands. Russell, just so you know, I, I just this morning I, I dropped, uh, I think it was uh, 200, 200 and something gigabytes of uh, of that four K video we just took on the Eagles trip. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to getting that and, and, and processing it. I think it's going to take all day to get that uploaded. Yeah, that's a, that's good stuff. It's just an, an amazing tool to use too. The, yeah. the, so this is a good example. These ibis we saw in a, in a tree, uh, this old dead tree. And those are mangroves in the background. And those mangroves are a cool study in nature all to their own, how they all, how those mangroves will, will send out a uh, just a little seed pod and then it'll land on an oyster bar somewhere and then all of a sudden a new mangrove island will will take a hold. And, you know, again, that area we photographed in called 10,000 Islands was just that. I mean, there were little mangrove islands everywhere and everywhere you could create that pocket of habitat, some kind of animal would occupy that habitat. And in this one, uh, we, we shot this one from the boat, just cruised right up to these ibis as they sit there and Gave us a really nice background and a really cool, you know, object that they were sitting on. And it's, uh, it was pretty neat. And that's, uh, so that picture there, it's of another turn, but you're starting to see the, and you can see it in the background a little more, but that's the fledglings of an oyster reef that are, that are forming right there. So those oysters will congregate in the big beds. Uh, and the kind of oysters, I don't know if they eat these oysters, but it's because there's several species of oysters, but it's the same type of shellfish that we eat. Uh, they'll build these big oyster reefs, and th those are the beginnings of the one right there starting to peak up. You can see a little bigger one there in the background, but every time, you know, you you, you give animals water. You weren't on this webinar, but a couple weeks ago we did one over, over, uh, over backyard bird photography, and I talked about the importance of the five uh, things that all wildlife species needs to thrive and that's food, water, cover, space, and arrangement. You know, you got water here, which is salt water, but there's enough fresh water that comes down in an area they can utilize it. But water, you got plenty of food for them because there's shellfish galore, uh, cover in the mangrove swamps and then space. And they've got the space to do it. It's not developed. And then the arrangement, just that magical mix of where the food is in relation to the water in relation to the cover where they'll either loaf or roost or nest. And uh, and again, the arrangement of it all just gives them that, that, I mean, it just makes for a wildlife paradise. Oops, I put two pictures in there. This is my favorite brown pelican yeah, shot I did on the there. whole trip. Yeah, it's just, uh, it's beautiful light. This Actually, we floated up on a rookery one evening in the boat and set anchored right off this rookery, maybe... 30 yards away from it and watch bird after bird come into land to go to sleep for the night. And this was the, the favorite shot I took of it. Cause again, it's got the, all those elements, birds in flight, a little bit of action, great sky, great light. And uh, it's just, uh, just one of those shots that I dream about when I go to go to sleep at night. 
Those are those frigate birds that you saw. I've talked about earlier. There's a silhouette. This is one that's actually roosted, not a silhouette, but they're a interesting little bird. So this is kind of a cool shot here. We out in those mangrove islands is a uh, subspecies of raccoon that live out there. They're like the raccoons that we have inland, but they're smaller and they're more kind of brownish reddish in color. And they eat on crabs all day. And we floated by one island and this little guy was so curious about it, about us. He actually swam, tried to swim out, uh, out to us and get in the boat with us. And uh, to give you an idea of how this question, uh, I mean, to give you an idea of how close we were to this raccoon, uh, I shot that with a 200 millimeter lens because for some crazy reason, Russ, this is, this is when I question myself sometimes I've taken millions of pictures in my life, but for some crazy reason that day, Oh, I know why one of the guests says he good nature challenged me that cause we would see dolphins swimming out and they would jump alongside the boat. And so people would try to get pictures of the, of the dolphins. And he told me one day, just in a good nature, joking way, he says, if you think you're really good, get a picture of me of a dolphin where we can see its eye. And so that day I decided to leave my big lens, my 500 in the van. And I only took my 200 lens out with me because I thought it'd give me a better chance of shooting the dolphins and not have to keep up with a bunch of equipment. And so that's when we saw this raccoon. And, and that's when uh, I was, you know, 200 millimeters. That's a 200 millimeter shot. We were that close to that raccoon. That's fantastic, man. Um, Hey, Russell, real quick here. I got uh, – where to go? Um, got a comment uh, from, from one of your guests on the, uh, on, the, on the trips this winter from Mary Beth. She's oh. on here. Hi, Mary Beth. Hey, Mary Beth. And uh, she says, there's no question. Just want to say she just wants to say that Russ G is an amazing guide instructor. This trip was amazing. I love my time with the group and places I was able to see. Wonderful addition to your locations. That's great to hear. Thank you, Cause, Thank you Mary Because because Mary Jo was my co. Kudos to you, she was my co-pilot during the whole trip. She sat up front with me the whole time and kept me entertained and uh, and uh, we we had a lot of good conversations and it was a it was great to see her getting back out into the uh, in, in, into the wild because you know I mean she, she'd been one of those in one of those states with the uh, with the uh, uh, you know, more strict quarantine orders and for her to get back out and, and me get to share that time with her was pretty special for me to Mary, Mary Beth. So I, I appreciate you saying that. Now this picture of this egret coming in land, you can see all the heads in behind it. There was just, I mean, there were tens of thousands of birds on that marsh that morning when we went there. And I think, Mary, and so since Mary Beth's listening, the, I took this picture the very last morning we were there, we were headed generally back to the airport and uh we stopped one one last time to uh we stopped one last time to photograph and and we I mean, the, the marsh was loaded with birds this is one of my favorite birds here too it's a roseate spoonbill and we were able to get some great shots of that and uh those things get their coloration based on the type of shrimp they're eating and so some you'll see more pink than others but this guy came uh came floating right into us and it was just beautiful and the water is beautiful and everything else is great. So Russ, you remember me saying last week, one of the killer shots I love to get is a panning shot where the eye is sharp in focus. I don't, doesn't bother me if the wings are a little bit out of focus, but we can get that good sense of motion with the background. And uh, I actually shot this one out of the, uh, out of the boat when we were in the ever in 10,000 islands, we were, we were dry, flying and we looked at our, our, uh, I mean, we were, we were we looked at our right side, and that egret was flying right alongside of us. So on a whim, I took a couple of pictures, and as far as I can tell, that's a pretty sharp eyeball there. Another roseate spoonbill. There's a big pelican coming into land. Those things are so cool, though. And that was kind of my money shot. I wanted to get a good picture of a roseate spoonbill and fly it, and that's what I said earlier, it's kind of quartering towards you, uh, about to flare for the last time before it lands. But that's uh, I re that's probably one of my personal favorite shots I took, just because it's is a shot I was wanting to get, and it was that's one I was able to check off my list as well. Excellent. Yeah. Wow. 
and I'm going to kind of roll through these. I know we're, I don't know what time you want to quit. I mean, I, I'm, I, you've heard this, me say this before Russ, but I, so I, I live in the country, everybody listening. I live in the country North of Dodd city, Texas, which is a little town in Northeast Texas. And so you were, you were talking with the entire photography enthusiast community of Dodd city right now. So anybody, anytime someone asks me to talk about photography, I always take that opportunity and uh, I could talk about these pictures for hours if you wanted me to, but uh, yeah, just set aside a whole day. Now I'll kind of roll through these a little quicker. I mean, there's just, it's, you know, for me, it's hard not to be excited about it. I mean, when you, when you get to go do something you absolutely love and are passionate about and get to go to some of the best places in the world to do it, uh, man, it just, it's, I mean, I like, I'm like a kid in the candy store. And I mean, literally I have taken millions of pictures of my life. And every time I push that button and see a picture like this one, I mean, I just, I never get tired of doing it. And it's just something that, that, that I've always been, been pretty passionate about. And it's, uh, you know, from a, from a personal standpoint, from a professional standpoint, I mean, it's, it's, it's what's fed my family for a lot of years now. And so, uh, I've got both emotional and financial connections to it. So I could talk about it forever because I love, I mean, and let me, Oh yeah. Sorry, Russell. No, 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 no. Go ahead. Totally cut you off there. Um, let me just say, as I'm, as I'm watching, I'm watching things come in here, uh, we have, so these trips, um, these trips we've got slated there for December 12th, the 17th this coming year. So 2021. And then we've got January 9th to 14th, 2022. So both, both over the winter. Um, and we, and we've just reserved the boat. Um, it's it's kind of cool. It's the same guy who does outings for Sierra club, you know, except backcountry journeys, of course, are a hundred percent photography focused. Um, and, uh, and they're timed perfectly at low tide. So the whole, the whole week, you're going to be at, at more or less uh, the best low tide conditions. And the neat thing about Florida that time of year is that because they're kind of on a 12 hour daylight cycle or, uh, you know, you're going to have uh, low tide both at sunrise and, and towards sunset. So it, it's, it's really helpful for, you know, for getting those, just the great light on the birds. And, and, and then, you know, the low tide comes in for great activity too. So, um, so we have six spots on each of those trips. Uh, and Russell's at least currently running both of those. Um, so if you're a fan of his work and you want to go out with him and, and, and go, go to the Everglades, um, sign up. We've got currently we have, let me just look here. We are out of the 12 spots we have, we're down to seven now. So just, you know, if you want to join this trip, I'm going to send out this thing here and that, and we're doing a We're doing a special today only too. So if you, you know, if you book the trip today, early bird special, you get $500 off the price. And, um, yeah, and there you go. So you can click that and, and go read about it and, uh, make sure to download the trip packet too. You should be able to do that directly here in the webinar, uh, or you can get it off our website too. So yeah, I'll, I'll just, all right. I'll just keep rolling through these a little quicker. Uh, I'll stop and talk about a couple of them, like this alligator snapping turtle. We saw him in the Everglades crossing the road. So we stopped and got out and shot pictures of him. When I was a kid, my grandpa used to tell me if they ever bit you, they wouldn't let go until they heard thunder. And uh, I've, I've always kind of believed that. So I've never tried to get bit by one. But those are those are pretty, the pretty powerful jaws those guys have on them. Ospreys, if you like ospreys, we saw tons of them all the way from nesting to everything else. There, there's a. There's my uh, favorite black vulture shot we took. I couldn't have posed it in a better spot. You know, it's sitting in an oak tree, live oak tree with that Spanish moss hanging around it. Great background and just that little window that he's sitting in. Uh, I'm a fan. A couple more egrets sort of jostling one another. If you like reflections of birds, I can't think of a better place. This is a common bird that we see in the cities all the time, but these boat-tailed grackles, if you take the time to pay attention to how iridescent they are and how animated animal they are, it's uh, it's pretty cool. And that's just a couple I shot, another alligator. Ospreys in flight. And these are uncropped, by the way. Uh, I should point out, that's how close we got to these animals. And that's a... Uh, so on the first trip, we never saw any, but on the second trip, we saw these uh, swallow-tailed kites, which are kind of a harbinger of spring down there. And so when they show up, all the locals will tell you that springtime has arrived. And we saw those the, 
right at the tail end of the second trip we did. And those are pretty cool birds as well. Russell, we had a we had a we had a com or question on here about uh, will we will will we will members off also have opportunities to shoot landscape photos on this trip? Yeah, so absolutely. So I had a landscape picture there that I kind of glossed over, but I've got it, another one or two here. You can kind of see what it looks like. And my favorite way to photograph uh, landscapes here in a minute on this. This is another kind of crazy bird we saw. This is the oyster catcher, and that's what they he's sitting on an oyster reef, and that's what they feed on, and. Uh, those things, you can tell their beaks really orange, their eyes really orange, and they hunt in colonies. So if you see one, we're probably going to see about 10 or 15 more. And that's a little falcon we saw hanging out with the rest of the birds. Another brown pelican. Another brown pelican. That's when the half, half moon, so we had big tides then. And that's an ibis in flight. Those are graceful little flowers. And that's one of those times we, we anchored next to a rookery at sunset and uh, just took pictures of bird after bird as they flew in to, to nest for the night. There's a landscape shot. It's typical of the landscapes we'll see down there. This is this is one nature of the swamp we'll, go, we'll look at. So there's really actually two kinds of swamps. There's a, or three kinds of swamps. There's more of an estuarial swamp around the mangrove islands. And then there's this big cypress area, the, the big cypress swamps. And then, uh, and then the the uh, Everglades swamps as well, and this is more of the this is it. This picture here was actually one. Uh, it rained and then the sun came out. This picture was uh, at Anhinga Trail. So this is a freshwater swamp that we we photographed that really low rainbow hanging over, and more more fal peregrine falcons and black crowned night heron is what that is. We floated up him on a boat. And so, Mary Beth, you might be interested to know the first little raccoon we saw, we went back to the same island the next week, and we this is the same raccoon we saw again. And uh, I actually had my big lens with me this time. I was able to shoot this photograph. Yeah, that's another one of those uh, frigate birds. You can see how big his wingspan is. It almost looks like a pterodactyl the way they look when they're flying around because you rarely see them flap. You always see them just soaring around. And then a blue heron, another purple galanule. I sat for 20 minutes trying to get a picture of this uh, dragonfly landing because it would land on the stick and then fly around. And uh, I want to get a nice sharp shot of it on a good background and backlit at that. That was my criteria and was able to, to get that. And uh, I, I'd be willing to bet everybody there thought we were crazy because there's four photographers standing around trying to take a picture of a dragonfly like this. But... Again, in the spirit of you love all of God's creatures, that's why we stop for it because they're interesting animals. So we didn't do any underwater stuff, but one of the things that I always do is I've got a GoPro I take with me because sometimes we'll have the opportunity to see stuff in shallow water, and this was one of them. This was a, 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 a gar fish that's only relegated to Florida. It's called the Florida gar. Up here in Texas, we have alligator gars, and they live in muddier water, and you never see them underwater. You see them when they float up to the top, but it's hard to see them. But I actually shot that picture because there was a little canal, a ditch right beside the road, and there was a bunch in there. And I put my GoPro on the end of my tripod and stuck it underwater and shot a few pictures of the of the gar like that. And I, I've done that technique. If you ever go to Katmai, it's also a good technique to take pictures of the, of the salmon underwater too. And I've done that with, with the same way. But those GoPros are amazing little cameras. You don't think about it, but they've got a – 4,000 wide pixel uh, resolution, and it's they're, they're pretty nice shot, pretty nice uh, overall. And we didn't see a lot of manatees, but here's one we saw. This one actually came up to the dock, and that's his nostril sticking out of the water. But he actually came up to the dock and was drinking fresh water off the dock after it rained when we were down in the, in the Flamingo area of the Everglades. And there's another landscape shot we talked about. This is my favorite way to shoot landscapes down there because it doesn't, even though you could shoot them otherwise, it doesn't have a traditional landscape like you would see out west where you've got a big mountain that dominates the background part of the image. And then, you know, you can put something like rocks or a stream in the foreground part. A lot of the Everglades are kind of wide open like this, just big, wide open, flat grasslands. And so my favorite way to shoot when you don't have a strong foreground element 
or necessarily a strong background element, but it's a beautiful landscape nonetheless, or to shoot panoramics like this. And that's one of the things we worked on when we were down there, Russ, was how to how to how to shoot a panoramic and then stitch them all together using Lightroom. And then that way you take an otherwise mundane scene and can make it something that is, is interesting to look at, but moreover tells a story about how, what it all looks like down there and how the animals play a key part into that. What you can't see is on the bottom left of this picture, just right out of frame, there's an alligator sitting there when I took this picture. And I was going to try to include him in the shot, but he was, he just was kind of up in the brush a little bit and you just couldn't see him that well. But yeah, there's an alligator right there. So there's a the landscape shot. And this is a green heron. We actually heard him calling up in the brush. It's right when the sun came up and found him and he would make that croaking noise about every 15 seconds whenever we get shots of that. And it's not all about shorebirds. This is actually a pine warbler that lives up in those. Uh, so in the, in the Everglades, as you drive through, you'll see the big vast uh, grasslands of swamps. But then you'll see little pockets. We could in Texas, we call them mots. You'll see mots of trees growing everywhere. But there they call them hammocks. And in those pine and in those uh, mahogany hammocks, you'll find a lot of, lot of songbirds living up in those hammocks. And it's amazing. The elevation changes by just a few inches. And then where it's a little bit drier, then all of a sudden this new plant community uh, develops and, and grows around it. And so that's, what, uh, that's where we found this little pine warbler. Another swallowtail kite. I think this may be my last picture in the group. This was a young alligator. The picture makes it look a lot bigger, but he was probably six or eight feet long. It wasn't real big, but he was uh, he was just hanging out in a swamp right by a boardwalk. We were walking on the on the very last day when we were there. Oh no, it's not my last picture. On the very last day we were there, I was able to get an interesting composition. I mean, I'm not much of a purist when it comes to photography. I just like good pictures and all the elements included, but I wish that grass wasn't in front of his face. That would have made it a little bit better, but it's not like I can go out and grab an alligator and move them where I want to move them to. This is the interesting bird we saw a lot of, and I tried to get pictures of them. And on the last day of the second trip, walking out to the van to leave for good, we found him and it's a, uh, it's a gray cat bird. And he just lives in kind of the, the brushy areas around the wetlands, not in the wetland itself, but in the brushy areas around the wetland. And we found him setting up in a, in a, in some brush. I think, yeah, that, this is my last picture here. And to top it off, this was not the last picture I took on the second trip, but almost the last picture I took on the second trip, the last series we hunted. The first week I couldn't find them and I looked for them when I was scouting. Second week, I finally found where they were at and they were, uh, there's an endangered species of tortoise down there called the gopher tortoise, and they live in holes. And I actually found a uh, colony of gopher tortoises. And every day we'd go by there and look for them and never saw them. We saw one with his head stuck out of the hole one time, but as soon as we drove by, he, uh, he ducked out. And literally, I said this about that one earlier, but literally this was the last hour of the trip, and we drove by. And nature shined a, her bright light upon us. And we found one gopher tortoise out walking around and we were able to shoot a picture of him. And, and, you know, I love animals of all kinds, but to see something that's, you know, rare and relegated to only a certain part of the whole country, uh, that kind of made it, made, made a, uh, impression on me. And if the rest of what we saw down there wasn't endearing enough, this getting to see that gopher tortoise really at the last minute was kind of, that was the icing on the cake for me. And just, a, again, a phenomenal trip, phenomenal experience, not only for me, but you heard what Mary Beth said for the guests as well. And, uh, man, it's just can't wait, can't wait to go back again. That's all. I, that's about all I have to say about that, Russ. Fantastic images, Russell. That was that was great. Thank you. It makes me I appreciate it. Make sure I want to get down there and get getting some warm weather. I keep I know I've told you this several times, but, you know, Crystal and I haven't even been in 70 degree weather since um August of uh, 2019 now. I know, know, right? Up here. Yeah, so it's been, so 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 the idea of, of getting down there and soaking up some warm weather just looks fantastic. And then all these, you know, all these just, you know, this bewildering variety of birds and wildlife. What a cool trip. It was. Did uh, anybody else have any qu other questions about the trip at all? Yeah, if you guys have questions, put them in the Q&A panel here real quick and we'll wrap up. 
Uh, I just want to say real quick that uh, uh, the, the next time you'll find Russell Graves on a backcountry journey trip will be out in the Great Smoky Mountains in April. We're, uh, you know, we're, we're right now, we're gearing up for a really busy year. Um, uh, we've got a lot. It's, it's, uh, and we've got trips in Utah and Yosemite coming up in April. I'm actually heading out this evening. If anybody's on here who's on my Alaska beautiful raw trip, Alaska Uncharted Beautiful and Raw, I think we call it. Uh, we're heading out for a 12-day excursion to photograph eagles, northern lights, and big mountain scenes. And so I meet the group this afternoon. So if any of you guys are on that, hello, and I'll see you in a few hours. Um, but, uh, yeah, a lot, a lot of exciting things. Do you remember last week when we were having kind of a – we were eating lunch or dinner, and the topic of conversation is what's your favorite place to photograph? Do you remember we had that conversation last week? Russ, I didn't, I didn't, you cut out a little there. I didn't catch you. Oh, oh well, well, what I was saying was, do you remember last week when we were, I think, can't remember if it was at lunch or supper that we were having a conversation regarding where's your favorite place to take pictures? Do you remember that conversation? Yeah. My yeah, conversation, yeah, yeah. my conversation was when it came my turn, I stumbled for an answer for a little bit. And then I said, well, it's kind of like you asking me which, of my children do I love the most? And you just can't answer that question. And so that's the cool thing about the backcountry journeys and where we go is, uh, man, they're all my favorites. And uh, now Florida is among my favorite and Smoky Mountains are among my favorite. And I think after that, I think I'll be in Yellowstone is among my favorites. I just got back from a trip on Bald Eagles with Russ and a trip right before that on Northern Lights of Alaska. And that was my favorite. And so they're all Man, they're just they're they're all great locations to go, and uh, I'm I'm always I'm I'm always thankful. Number one, that uh, I get to go do that, and number and number two, and not necessarily in this order, just the people, the customers that Backcountry Journey has, and just the high quality of people that travel on these trips, and the people that we get to meet and uh, hang out with for not only a week, but really to to uh, make lifelong friends with. I don't know if you heard my phone ding a couple of times while I was on this webinar. But when I glance down at it, that's a, a guest from a from a prior trip showing off some pictures they just took. So uh, that always makes my day to stay in contact with people like that and see the stuff that they're not only worked on when 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 we're with them, but they're they're still continuing to work on and be excited about long after a trip has ended. So that's uh, that's that's sort of what drives me. You know, at the end of the day, um, what it all come what it all boils down to is we are all of us, all of us are a group of of uh, you know. Uh, travel enthusiastic nature photographers. And that's mm -hmm. what we love. Um, and, I, and I don't mean like us as the Backcountry Journeys guides. I mean, all of us, all of our group members, our yeah. tribe members. You know, it's a great thing. We love you guys. And uh, we certainly love, uh, you know, seeing seeing the familiar faces on these webinars. And webinars is, oh, we have come to really love these. Uh, you know, obviously this started because of this, this pandemic that we hope is just behind us soon. Uh, you know, but um, it's something we're going to keep doing because it's, uh, yeah, I just, I love being able to jump on here and connect with, with all of you and, 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 you know, have chances just to have face to face with all of our guides too from time to time. So yeah, it's a lot of fun and we're going to, we're going to keep it up going forward. Well, good. Uh, did any other questions come in? I, I can't see the questions from my side. So I, I don't think so. I think that's it. So uh, okay. yeah, thanks a lot guys for joining us. Thank you, Russell. Yeah, thank you. And have fun on your trip this week. And uh, I know you got a couple of guests that I've been with before. So tell them I said hello and good luck to everybody on that trip. And uh, I know you guys are going to do great. Yeah, yeah, we will. Okay. Well, right on, you guys. Uh, thanks for joining us. And if you want to watch this later, it will be on our YouTube channel here probably in about a week. So okay. you can catch up there too. Awesome. All right. Well, hey, I appreciate right. it, everybody. Uh, Russ, have fun. And everybody on the uh, Swati and Mary Beth, and I don't, I don't know who else may be out there that I, I've been on trips with to know. You guys take care, and I hope to get to meet some of the other guys really soon. Adios. Take care.